On this Thursday night, new ammunition for the U.S. president in his war of words against the media and the FBI. A hotly anticipated report takes former director James Comey to task. But does it actually help Donald Trump? Also tonight, after CBC News exposed high-pressure sales tactics from telecoms, today the government took action. And NAFTA negotiations are back on after a wild week of tariff tit-for-tat. We'll look at what still stands in the way of a deal and why you should probably mark 2019 on your calendar. Hint, it's all about elections. This is The National. Donald Trump turned 72 today, and the U.S. president received what he might consider a birthday gift. An internal investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice delivered a report that could help him against a political foe. The FBI director he fired last year, James Comey. As Stephen D'Souza explains, the report was scathing in its judgment of how Comey handled the FBI probe into former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. To some, James Comey is the man who cost Hillary Clinton the presidency. To others, he's the one who could help bring down Donald Trump. Today's much-anticipated report into the FBI's Hillary Clinton email investigation was seen as a possible goldmine of ammunition for critics in both camps. I'm here to give you an update. In announcing Clinton would not be charged for her handling of State Department emails, FBI Inspector General Michael Horowitz found Comey was insubordinate, but says that decision wasn't politically motivated. The report also says Comey's reopening of the investigation just days before the presidential election was a serious error in judgment. If this was the president's plan to take down the, the special counsel, President Trump swung and missed. It's deeply disturbing that the Republicans... Democrats tried to head off any Republican efforts to use the report to undermine the FBI's reputation and, by extension, the Mueller investigation into Russian election interference. Unfortunately for them, nothing in this report lays a glove on special counsel Mueller or the ongoing Russia probe. Not so, says the president's press secretary. It reaffirmed the president's suspicions about Comey's conduct and the political bias among some of the members of the FBI. Those members include two agents whose private messages have already been held up as evidence of anti-Trump bias at the bureau. The report found a new one, which will no doubt fuel more theories. Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right? No, no, he's not. We'll stop it. Mueller removed the agent who wrote that from his team 10 months ago, and the current FBI director says people will be held accountable. Nothing in this report impugns the integrity of our workforce as a whole or the FBI as an institution. That, it seems, is a matter of perspective. The big question emerging from this report, will it impact James Comey's credibility in the eyes of the public and any role he plays when the special counsel finishes its work? Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Washington. Though some people worked on both probes, there is no clear link between Comey's conduct with Hillary Clinton and the special counsel investigation of the Trump campaign. But Trump supporters may be keen to make that link if the past year is any guide. Oh, and there's Jim. He's become more famous than me. <laughs> Trump's defenses against allegations of obstructing justice hinge on discrediting Comey. The former FBI director's version of events presents a problem. I was fired in some way to change, or the endeavor was to change the way the Russia investigation was being conducted. On the Russia investigation itself, Trump's strategy has been pretty clear. The entire thing has been a witch hunt. Phony witch hunts going against me. It's a Democrat hoax. Hoax. There's hoax. We're under siege. You understand that. For more than a year, Trump and his supporters have tried to paint the Mueller investigation as a deep state cabal out to get him. For Trump, it appears undermining confidence in Mueller is critical. Have you talked to President Trump since your indictment? Pressure on his former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and his lawyer, Michael Cohen, seemed to mount by the week. Do you think the president still has your back? For Trump's legal team, the worry could be they turn witness, just like a host of other former Trump aides. The strategy does appear to be working. A recent poll showed suspicion of Mueller has risen since last July. Among Republicans, the crucial group for Trump, it has skyrocketed from 27 to 53%. 
And as Mueller's public support wavers, time could be an issue. Midterm elections looming in the fall, and Mueller will either have to present his findings or wait until after the vote. As the FBI Inspector General made clear today, justice and politics don't mix. But the president's legal troubles don't end with Robert Mueller. Trump and his charitable foundation are being sued by New York's attorney general. Today, she accused him of illegally using the Trump Foundation for business ventures and legal bills and of using his charity to support his presidential campaign. On Twitter, Trump called the case ridiculous and said he won't settle. Here's what else we're tracking tonight. Thousands of fans from around the world are celebrating day one of soccer's World Cup. Host country Russia is hoping the event will help boost its international image. Vancouver is getting set to regulate short-term rentals, and Airbnb says it will help enforce the regulations, but will it work? But first, as tensions simmer between the U.S. and Canada, Christia Freeland holds face-to-face -face talks with the U.S. top official on trade. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs says that meeting with Robert Lighthizer today was productive. Still, as Katie Simpson tells us, other trade threats still loom. Cooler heads seem to prevail in Washington. The Foreign Affairs Minister says after an hour-long meeting with her U.S. counterpart, both agreed to keep the lines of communication open. NAFTA talks continue and that we're going to make a real push over the summer. While the pledge is light on specifics, it appears a more positive tone is returning to the trade negotiations. And I'll say what I've said uh, yesterday and the day before. Freeland left one high-profile meeting for another, sitting down with Ontario's progressive conservative premier-designate as a show of cross-party unity. Uh, we're going to be working hand-in-hand -hand to make sure that we negotiate uh, this trade deal and make sure we're successful at that. The cooperation is being welcomed by Ottawa after a difficult week for Canada-U.S. relations. President Donald Trump called Prime Minister Justin Trudeau dishonest and weak because Trudeau said Canada would not be pushed around by the U.S. on trade. He learned that's going to cost a lot of money for the people of Canada. He learned you can't do that. You can't do that. There are fears tensions could grow worse if Trump follows through on his threat to impose new tariffs on imported vehicles. I think you should always take Donald Trump seriously when he says he might do something. Um, and those that have thought that maybe he wasn't going to do what he says he's going to do find out that he does it, and then, then you're backtracking. While Canadians may be united in their opposition to Trump's actions... One, two, three... There appears to be less consensus among American voters. He crossed a line as broad as any border wall he would ever conceive of wasting our money on. But I hope no one in Canada thinks that there are people in America who believe what he said. Well, I think it's time for the United States to get their fair share of trade. I mean, it's just he's just asking for it to be fair. He's not asking to be ripped off anymore, and that's part of making America first. The CBC's Katie Simpson has been camped out in Washington again. Uh, Katie, Christian Freeland says NAFTA negotiators are going to try and push through the summer. What is the reality here? Can they actually make some progress? There are two issues here, Rosie, and the first is that all sides are pretty entrenched in their positions, so there won't be much progress until someone is ready to blink. The second is that talks are going to have to be put on hold for the Mexican federal election on July 1st, and then if there isn't a deal by the fall, talks will again pause for the U.S. midterm elections, which would make it very likely this issue will drag into next year. Of course, 2019 is an election year in Canada, so that could be problematic too. Yes, or very interesting. Okay, Katie, thanks for your coverage as usual. Thanks. Meanwhile, Canada is facing more trade uncertainty tonight, this time from Italy. Its new agriculture minister told an Italian daily the country will not ratify CETA, the Canada-EU trade deal, because it contains too few protections for Italian products. Freeland was asked about that today, too. We had a good conversation about CETA uh, with Prime Minister Conte of Italy uh, at Charlevoix, and we look forward to continuing that conversation. I would also like to 
CETA entered into force provisionally last September, meaning that tariffs on a large number of goods have already been lifted, but all 28 EU members must ratify the deal for it to take full effect. Much more ahead on the brewing U.S.-Canada trade war. Lots to talk about tonight. I've been waiting all week for it. At issue is here, Andrew Chantal and Paul, all standing by. We'll get into all of it a little later on The National. Also in Washington today, some heated moments in the briefing room of the White House over a very contentious issue, separating migrant children from their parents. We would like to fix these loopholes, and if Democrats want to get serious about it instead of playing political games, they're welcome to come here and sit down with the president and actually do something about you're it. You're a Jill. parent. Don't you have any empathy? Jill, go ahead. Come on, Sarah. You're a parent. Don't you have any empathy for what these people are going through? And that was just a snippet of that exchange. And pictures like this explain the fight. A Texas Walmart transformed into a detention center for young migrants, some not even teenagers, but all caught in a tough crackdown by the Trump administration. And as Paul Hunter shows us, all facing an uncertain future. The numbers grow and they grow. Undocumented migrants arriving in the U.S. along its southern border. These pictures are from last month when 88 of them were found hidden inside that truck north of Brownsville, Texas. This week in San Antonio, they found more than 50 in this truck. And in a so-called stash house, another 62. The monthly count along the border gets into the many thousands. But what's new is what's happening once they're caught. Indeed, as demonstrators in Washington underline in angry protest, families are being torn apart. Children, babies are being ripped away from their mother's arms. And if that's not psychological torture, I don't know what is. Under a directive by the Trump administration, all migrants caught crossing illegally now face prosecution. Under U.S. law, when adults are jailed awaiting a trial for any crime, their children are put in government custody. In Texas, where courtrooms are now packed with migrants, many who'd come with their children, horror stories abound. One of the women that I interviewed today told me that she was breastfeeding her daughter when the government took her daughter from her. And when she resisted, she said that was when they put handcuffs on her. Authorities who say such allegations are unsubstantiated have meanwhile set up shelters for detained young migrants. These images are of the largest shelter, a former Walmart, now known as Casa Padre for boys aged 10 to 17, some 1,500 of them. I don't think that this represents the values of the American people. Still, no one has the perfect answer. The U.S. says its new zero tolerance is needed to deter illegal immigration. But the migrants keep coming. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, critics say zero tolerance is too harsh. An archbishop even called the separation of children from their parents immoral. But that didn't stop the attorney general from using the Bible as justification. Illegal entry into the United States is a crime. It should be. It must be. And I would cite you to the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans uh, 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained, ordained the government. Sessions added that Americans who go to jail can't take their children with them and migrants in detention centers shouldn't expect to either. Well, let's change course now. The 2018 FIFA World Cup kicking off today with a victory for the home team. But as our Chris Brown explains, Russia may be on the verge of a bigger win off the field. If they awarded a trophy for best fans, Peru would easily have won it in Moscow today. For their team's first World Cup appearance in more than three decades, they were everywhere. It's a nice llama. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> However controversial it is to have Russia as World Cup host, fans just arriving seem more surprised than anything else. It's Open. surprisingly beautiful. Oh, yeah. Moscow has never had so many foreign visitors show up at once. I think that it's going to change uh, our minds and the uh, mind of uh, people who are living not in Russia. FIFA sold over two and a half million tickets for this World Cup, but for fans who didn't happen to get one of them, there's always this, a giant fan zone, and on day one it was packed. And Russian fans didn't go home disappointed. 
Their team clobbered Saudi Arabia 5-0. Photographers caught Vladimir Putin entertaining the Saudi crown prince, but the leaders of practically every Western country stayed away. The tournament is already an organizational success for Putin, and it's shaping up to be a political win, too. Despite sanctions, despite uh, the attempts uh, to isolate our country from the rest of the world, look, we host a major, major event. Human rights activists, though, are continuing to urge fans to boycott the event. In Ukraine, they rallied in support of imprisoned film director Oleg Sentsov, and outside the Kremlin today... The persecution of LGBT Russians. British gay rights campaigner Peter Tatchell protested a Russian law that prohibits promoting anything to do with homosexuality. He was quickly arrested. By and large, though, most who come to Moscow appear far less interested in Russian politics, far more enthusiastic about watching the game they love. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Still ahead tonight on The National, Drake goes back in time to the role that first made him famous. Yeah, Degrassi fans, take note, he's putting the band back together. As Canadian cities move to regulate short-term rentals such as Airbnb, we ask, can it work? And it's been one year since the Grenfell Tower fire, but for those who survived, the memories of what happened are still fresh. I can actually see people behind those windows. Dying, trying to get out. We are live tonight on The National, tracking a developing story in Toronto, a broad daylight shooting of two girls at a playground. Toronto police say the two sisters, ages five and nine, are now both in stable condition, but both needed immediate surgery. Here's Toronto's police chief. Obviously, these two uh, young uh, girls are not the intended targets. Some cowards came into this neighborhood and opened fire into a playground. Police are now looking for two suspects, a driver and a shooter. And despite them still being on the loose, police say they don't believe there's any further threat to the public at this time. And an update tonight on the investigation into stolen Banksy artwork in Toronto. Police have released this surveillance video from Sunday morning of what appears to be the thief brazenly walking off with the piece. Trolley Hunters is worth about $45,000. And we're also following a couple of stories tonight affecting your money. In a moment, we'll tell you how Canadian cities are trying to regulate short-term rentals like Airbnb. But first, if you or anyone you know has ever been the target of a hard sell for phone or internet service, this next story is for you. The message is very clear. Canadians are concerned. We've heard them loud and clear, and we're taking action. Today, the federal government ordered an investigation into sales tactics by Canada's largest telecom companies. It comes after months of stories from CBC's Go Public, documenting allegations of aggressive and misleading sales practices. Behind the accusations were customers, but also telecom employees who say they were pressured to lie to hit sales targets. And now Canada's regulator, the CRTC, has been directed to hold a public inquiry. Now, joining us with more, the reporter behind those stories, Erica Johnson. So, Erica, remind us of what you found. Well, Andrew, we were first contacted by a customer sales representative inside a Bell call center, Andrea Rizzo, and she was on stress leave at the time. She said the pressure to meet sales targets had taken a toll, that she was expected to make a sale or try to make a sale on every call with every customer. And she felt that she was pushing products and services on customers who didn't need them, who couldn't use them, who might not even understand them. As an example, she cited the case of a 90-year-old woman who told her she was blind and Rizzo still felt pressured to sell her the internet. It's just been a non-stop nightmare for me. And, you know, I'm not only speaking on behalf of myself, but everyone else. It's, it's not just me. Now, after that story, we heard from more than 200 other telecom employees, not just from uh, Bell and Rogers, but also Telus and Shaw, saying they too had similar sales pressures. Right, but, but why a public inquiry now? I mean, the CRTC had said several times it wasn't necessary. 
Well, that's right. I spoke with the minister responsible for the CRTC today, Navdeep Baines, and he said he disagreed with the CRTC, that these stories were very concerning to him. He wanted a public inquiry, and he expects to have a full slate of recommendations by the time this inquiry wraps up, and that if it means better protecting people he says are vulnerable, he will be implementing those recommendations. Okay, Erica Johnson, thanks very much. Thank you. Now, as for when and how this investigation will unfold, no date has been set, but there is a deadline. The federal government wants both the inquiry and the report finished by February 28, 2019. Thousands of homeowners in Canada's most expensive cities have flocked to companies like Airbnb to make some extra cash. Some even rely on that to make their sky-high mortgage payments. Problem is, short-term rentals can cut into long-term supply, adding to the housing crisis. As Barry Stewart explains, that's prompted Vancouver and Toronto to crack down. This is one of the two suites that Paul Nedeshoko has on his Scarborough property and rents out on Airbnb. It's a, a small kitchenette with uh, cupboards, has all the utensils. Last year, the units brought in about $50,000. Income Nedeshoko says he would have to give up if Toronto's new short-term rental rules come into effect. It's a big game changer because not having any other income and, and without the ability to continue doing what we're doing, we're, we're faced with selling our house and, and moving elsewhere. Toronto's regulations were passed by City Council last year, but because they're being appealed at a provincial tribunal, they're currently on hold. That's not the case in Vancouver, where similar rules are already in place. Under the regulations, people need to have a license, and then they can only rent out their property on Airbnb if it's their primary residence. So you could list your spare bedroom or your entire house if you're going on vacation, but you couldn't rent out your basement suite. The city has more than 6,600 short-term rental listings, and many of them are now under scrutiny. Officials have investigated 1,500 postings so far and began with the most egregious. 14. Uh, operators had more than 10 listings so that was our obvious first place to start and then we have just continued to work down the list. And they're getting some help from social media sleuths, people who have been pouring through the listings on their own, even pointing out cases where some hosts are using the same license number for multiple listings. The city says those complaints are also now under investigation. So the city has launched a new short-term rental program. For those who have been pushing Vancouver City Council to regulate Airbnb rentals for years, they welcome the changes but believe they don't go far enough. Airbnb is not responsible for uh, ensuring the accuracy of the information that they get from the hosts. They're not responsible for uh, removing the, uh, any offending listings. They say it's not enough for the city to find people that don't comply with the rules. They should be holding platforms like Airbnb accountable as well. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Although Airbnb won't be enforcing Vancouver's new rules, it will share its information with city inspectors. And starting August 31st, the city says anyone who doesn't have a license for their listing could be fined $1,000 a day. That issue is up next. And if you haven't already, why don't you subscribe to our newsletter every afternoon? We take you inside our journalism and we also highlight some stories you might have missed. Today, it was Yemen's grinding three year civil war that has now entered a dangerous new phase. Subscribe to The National today, cbcnews.ca slash The National. Do you think the retaliatory measures make sense? Yes, I do. Somebody in this business, somebody puts a tariff on your products, you put a tariff on theirs. Now, how it's received on the other side is, is something else, but that's life. I actually like Justin. You know, I, I think he's good. I like him, but he shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. That's going to cost him a lot of money. No one will benefit from this bigger thy neighbor dispute. The price will be paid, in part, by American consumers and American businesses. And the price will also be paid by those who believe that a rules-based system is worth preserving. 
There were tariffs, a press conference, a number of tweets, and a war of words. That was former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney on Monday, President Trump on Tuesday, and Christia Freeland just yesterday, all trying to make sense of a relationship that has been one of the most stable bilateral friendships in the world, maybe not quite so much anymore. No one else we'd rather ask to take on the entire Canada-U.S. relationship in about 10 minutes at issue. Chantal Bear and Andrew Coyne, both in Toronto today, and Paul Wells is here with me in Ottawa. Good to see you all. Um, let's start with the, the, the latest uh, comment that we saw there, this speech uh, given by Christia Freeland. We just showed a little piece of it, but it was a fascinating uh, speech to listen to and to read because it seemed, to me anyway, to go in the opposite direction maybe of what the government has been saying it would do, and that is perhaps upping the ante. But maybe I'm misreading it. So, Chantal, how did you take those comments last night? I did not take them as upping uh, the ante from the prime minister's comment. I took them as in framing the issue in a larger okay. sense and a larger context of just this, uh, we're going to go after your milk and we're going to go after your steel mm -hmm. uh, issue uh, and trying to position it uh, as something that is, goes beyond trade experts fighting each other and tweets by politicians. Paul, what, what, what did you think of it? Um, it's another uh, demonstration of the of the uh, Trudeau government's decision to contrast with Trump. When like the the Democrats used to say, when he goes low, we'll go high. Um, when he goes erratic, the Canadians have decided to go consistent. So they've already announced their, their <laughs> they've already announced their slate of policies. They're going to pursue their slate of policies. The ante will up itself because the tariffs, the Canadian tariffs, haven't been introduced yet. They'll be introduced right. on Canada Day, and so uh, and 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 uh, American importers are going to start yelling. Uh, you know, in mid-afternoon of July 1st, and, and then we'll see whether the president listens to them more than he listens to Canadian officials. Derek Bernie was on uh, Power and Politics today, and, and at one point he says, listen, you're not going to win with the master of distraction, Andrew. So it, it, I, I don't know. when it, 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 th These are really good analysis of what that speech was. I just wonder who's listening and, and does it matter? Well, there's two audiences listening. One is to play the political audience at home, and that's always going to be part of, the, of any, uh, any of this show is how is it playing with the folks back home. Sure. But partly also it's trying to reach non-Trump people in the United States, particularly people who might be in a position to influence them. Um, and that's really all these things have to be measured against is what will work, not what feels good. Uh, I know there's a mood in the country right now, let's hit them as hard as we possibly can and let's say the nastiest things we possibly can. Uh, that would feel really good. It's questionable how, uh, how much good it would do. And I remain a skeptic about the value of the retaliatory tariffs, but we'll see. But there's a middle path we have to strike here, uh, and I'll, I'll say on both sides, because you're also getting people say, oh, how dare the prime minister even say what he said after the G7? How dare he even say, mm -hmm. you know, well, we're not going to be pushed around on this, which is anodyne uh, standard issue rhetoric, because we're not allowed to say anything to, depending on how Trump reacts. So we can't also be walking around in stocking feet. Um, there's some, some kind of middle path where we're not gratuitously offending them, but preserving a bit of national dignity. Right. So, uh, I mean, the prime minister's explanation, his office's explanation for that press conference was, oh, these are just things he said before. Uh, the president, you know, sh should have known. And, and, and we heard the fallout from that. So uh, th I guess the question then, Chantal, is what is the point in ever responding if we never know how someone who is clearly behaves erratically might might react? Because we, uh, the other audience, need to know where our government is. Uh, and until those tweets came no one had thought that uh, the prime minister had made news at that news conference. No. Yeah. Uh, and he, it basically, he would have made news if suddenly his answer from the week before had become something mm -hmm. else. And then the next question would have been, how come you changed your tone? Did something happen on the one-on-one -on -one meeting? Right. Right. Uh, and then he would have been, if anything happened, uh, giving details about a private conversation with the president that may or may not result in anything. The other point of what has happened over the past week is to send the message to those who are watching in the U.S., and there are a lot of, of U.S. who are Canadian watchers, mm -hmm. uh, that on this issue, the prime minister is on fairly large consensus ground, i.e. Canada's political class. While it may quarrel with this or that in the approach, is by and large not saying Justin Trudeau has mishandled this and, yes. and we need to do this or we need to do that. And on the tariffs, 
the approval rating for, for the retaliatory tariffs tell you that if you're going to ask at some point Canadians for concessions at the NAFTA table, you have to convince them that you fought the good fight for them. Yeah. The interesting thing with uh, some stuff that Christy Freeland was saying today, Paul, was she was actually trying to separate the tariffs from NAFTA because she did come out of this meeting today with the promise that negotiations for NAFTA would continue through the summer and the tariffs were some matter about national security over here. I, I get why she's trying to do that. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I buy that they're not related. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's no evidence that they're separated in the president's mind. And at the end of uh, any negotiation, the decision goes back to the president. There's a, there's a, um, it, it seems pretty clear that about two weeks ago, they were very close to a deal and that the president decided he didn't like it. And so his own officials, Lighthizer and, and, and the others, had to, um, you know, had to, had to retreat. And so, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're heading into the kind of the maddening period of this, of this relationship, uh, where... Uh, we're just the, heading into it now. Yeah. Oh man, it was it was it was it, it was just a field of clover until now. I'll tell you, because now this president's going to say whatever he wants, and his and, and and we now know for sure that his negotiators have no autonomous power to negotiate uh, as as long as as long as he disagrees, and Canadian officials, the foreign minister and the prime minister first above them, have to keep. Uh, uh, being just maddeningly even keel and responsible, and and even though it, it's now paying no perceptible yes. dividends. Yeah. Uh, th there's Andrew, a much, go ahead. Well, there's much larger stakes here than just NAFTA. For one thing, you mentioned this at the outset, Rosie. That this is when we see the Trump modus operandi here. This isn't just about tariffs or North America trade. It's about his whole view and his administration's view of international agreements and international alliances altogether. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that he's on a mission to bust up as many of them as he possibly can. So we are the collateral damage at this point in that. And really all we can do, we the government, we the country, is try and, uh, I think, play for time. Just try and mm -hmm. mi mitigate the damage, try and prevent things from blowing up, hopefully try and prevent a, a bust up on NAFTA, but being prepared for even that to happen. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I don't think there's any win-win-win situation that's uh, any time soon. Okay, we only have about four minutes, so... You know, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I'm going to utter the word supply management and somehow we're going to make all that work in four minutes. Because this is an interesting example, Maxime Bernier uh, saying things that are not new or surprising and, and again, published, you know, I think it was still on his website from before, his views on some of these issues. And he gets slapped in the face uh, and kicked out of the shadow cabinet, presumably because he's speaking out against some things, but also calling into question an issue that while the government is on side about it, um, it presumably is up for debate as a policy issue. So I wonder, if, is this just about Andrew Scheer and Maxime Bernier? Is this about the issue of supply management? Are we no longer allowed to say anything critical about anything because we're negotiating? Chantal. Imagine if uh, Michael Chung, who also ran for the leadership on a platform that said it's time for the Conservative Party to embrace a carbon tax and lost, showed up uh, tomorrow with a long excerpt in the Globe and Mail to say how uh, he lost the leadership because some lobbies uh, went behind the yeah. others, the oil lobbies or others, and the t carbon tax is the only way to go. What would we say? We'd say mm -hmm. Michael Chong is in the shadow cabinet. The party policy on this is clear, uh, <laughs> crystal clear. Uh, and, and this debate is a debate that the party has to have at its convention or it has to have at caucus. But you cannot have someone in a shadow cabinet going against what the leader has identified and campaigned on as, as a core policy. And Andrew Scheer did campaign in favor of supply management. Yeah. They have embraced supply management. They're using it on the campaign trail in Quebec. Uh, and, and on that basis, it's not just a freedom of expression issue. To me, uh, it's an issue of the solidarity that you expect from people who are yeah. members of a shadow cabinet. Paul, your view on that. Um, Pierre Trudeau, uh, John Turner, uh, Brian Mulroney, uh, Jean Chrétien, their leaderships were all undone, not by the people they were facing, but by lieutenants in their own party who decided they'd have enough of them being the leader. So it's no wonder that leaders are a little paranoid about voices of dissent from within. Um, uh, I'm surprised that Max Bernier is still part of the Conservative caucus. Uh, I think the leader went easy on him. Andrew. Uh, I'm not as persuaded of that. I know uh, you're not. Like, go ahead and try and persuade us. Well, I'm not persuaded that it's, it's the, um, the, the member or the, or the shadow cabinet member's job always to do what's best for the leader, what's most convenient for the leader. I think it matters what the truth of the matter is. It matters what the issue is. It matters whether the party is taking a stand that it can really live with and support, whether the party, in fact, 
believes in that itself, or large sections of it don't. It matters how the leader did, in fact, get into his job, and it's, it's not illegal to point that out. I think it was, I don't think Max was being quite as uh, out of, out of, off the ter territory as people are claiming he was being. I think it's, uh, they were looking for an excuse to kind of make trouble because they, they wanted to move him away, hmm. and this was a convenient pretext to do it. If they just ignored it, I don't think anybody would have known it was on his website, that chapter of his book. Okay, okay, okay but for 30 seconds, uh, Chantal, do, do, is this an indication, just broadly, that supply management is this sacred cow now that everyone seems to think it is? Well, like we can't a, even talk about it? It's go you can talk about it all you want, but it is a sacred cow for an Andrew Shearer-run party yes. because he got elected on it. Uh, and so if he were tomorrow to say, I don't believe in this anymore, he yeah. would be the new Peter McKay who signed uh, to say, I'll never negotiate with the Conservatives to become the leader of the Tory party and then turned around and did that, except he'd do it on an issue of substance. So you either think that someone campaigns on something uh, and then it is something that he will defend or not. So for the Conservatives, yes, they are, it is a sacred cow to them until further notice. And for the rest of us as well, it would seem. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Good news for all of you who love politics as much as all of us do. At Issue is also a podcast. You get everything we talked about here and a little extra. This week on the podcast, all three major party leaders are hitting the by-election campaign trail in Quebec. Who will walk away with the win and why the heck does it matter? Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Now, what could possibly transition more seamlessly from Canadian politics than news about Drake? The superstar rapper dropped a new video last night. It's already lit up the internet, not least because it puts Drake back in the role that made him famous in the first place, with a little historical revision here and there. The new video for I'm Upset is all about Degrassi nostalgia with Drake, a.k.a. Jimmy Brooks, magically cured of the paralysis that had him in a wheelchair for five seasons. It features pretty much everybody from Degrassi, the next generation, even Rick, the troubled kid who shot Jimmy and put him in that wheelchair in the first place. But everybody still hates Rick. Principal Archibald Snake Simpson's in there, too, with Jay and Silent Bob setting a bad example. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Weed is not legal yet, guys. I'm upset. Half a million on my And then it gets even more bananas. Like someone tried their best, yeah. Wanna waste a half a million, be my guest. Once again, it was directed by talented Canadian Karina Evans, who also did God's Plan and Nice for What. I'm Upset dropped last night, but it's already been viewed millions of times on YouTube alone. It's a rare thing when thousands march through city streets and barely make a sound. But so it was in London today, as many took part in a silent march to honour the 71 people who died in last year's horrific fire at Grenfell Tower. Many are still haunted by that night. There are those who lost loved ones and others who will never forget what they saw and heard as their homes burned. Our Margaret Evans revisits Grenfell one year later to see what's changed and what hasn't. It was smoking for a long time as well. It's like, you know, a dead body, you know, consuming itself and, and, and burning down to, to death, you know. The shadows cast by the Grenfell fire have not dissipated. They clog the corners of memory and live in the eyes of those who watched helplessly as the tower burned and those who made it out. This is from my son. When he came home and he told me, get the hell out of there, the fire, the tower is burning, get out, get out, and he started crying. He went up and Antonio Roncolato lived on the 10th floor of Grenfell and Tower for 27 happy prepare. years. And shared, you know, good wines. He was the second last person to be rescued from it there, there when it burned. The, the, the fire was crawling down. Yeah. His son, he says, his lifeline to the rescuers who would eventually come. I was reassuring him that uh, this is not my day. I have still so many things to do and so many things to say and that I would make it out alive. Those who did lose loved ones exist in a universe of if-onlys, their grief and rage searing itself onto the nation's psyche at a public inquiry. I have flashbacks. I know they are just pictures in my head but I can actually see people behind those windows. 
Hissam Chukair lost his mother, sister, brother-in-law and three nieces. I don't see this as a tragedy. I see it as an atrocity. Because essentially, there is segregation between the rich and the poor. I think they call it a postcode lottery. Oh my God, they're screaming! The fire is thought to have spread with such terrifying speed because of the aluminum cladding attached to the outside of the building in 2016. Many Grenfell residents believe the council chose it because it was cheap. They say their safety concerns were ignored for years and that the cladding was mainly about hiding social housing considered an eyesore in one of London's richest boroughs. We want here a certain sort of people and then, you know, and the working class people, you know, you try to push them, you know, a little bit, but it's, it's true. The government here has pledged to replace the cladding on 159 social housing estates that have failed safety tests. The situation for private sector residential buildings is murkier. Residents of this block in South London found to have had similar cladding to Grenfell's were originally told by managers they'd have to pay for its removal. So yeah, we all were very nervous and in, in, in a shock. Anuj Vats and other residents protested. After a battle, the original builders agreed to pay, although work hasn't started yet. VAT says deregulation in Britain is part of the problem. Uh, government fails to give clear directions that how these, these buildings should be built and what the materials should be used. The tower that has stood like a tombstone on the London skyline for so long has again been covered in recent weeks, this time with white plastic sheeting and the green colours symbolising the Grenfell community. Antonio Rancolato would have preferred to see it remain uncovered as a permanent reminder. Either way, he says, the survivors will hold those to blame to account. This is our battle, this is our aim. So to make sure that, you know, uh, um, um, such a thing does not, does not ever happen again. That must be the legacy of the dead, he says. That and the extraordinary unity of purpose and sense of community that has grown up around Grenfell, despite the shadows and the pain. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, as you saw in Margaret's story, the emotions are still raw for a lot of people, including two 13-year-olds who survived the fire. So in the days just after, they poured their pain into music. They wrote a ballad, then made a video to mark this anniversary. reached out to them and they told us how that process has helped them to cope and to honour the friends they've lost. Have a listen. At the time, it was only three days after the fire had happened, so it was all fresh in our minds and we had a lot of emotion inside us, so it just sort of just came out. And it helped us because we prayed for the music and it just got the weight off our shoulders. but also we feel very proud because we feel like we're doing justice for our friends and everyone else who died in the tower. Tonight on the national political drama in Canada's north, just hours after Nunavut's legislature voted to oust their sitting premier, a new one is in place. Joe Savikatak takes over from Paul Kwasa, who was only elected last November, but he'd come under criticism for his leadership style. This is the first time the Nunavut legislature has removed a sitting premier. New numbers from StatsCan show that in the first quarter of this year, the population of Nunavut grew at a higher rate than anywhere else in the country. And overall, Canada is growing at record speed, with a population of more than 37 million people. The new numbers show it took just two years and two months to add a million people 
the shortest period ever. By comparison, it took 17 years to add the first million after Confederation. At the end of the Second World War, 12 million people lived here. By Canada's 100th birthday, more than 20 million. Overall, Canada added 4.6 million people in its first 50 years, almost 17 million in the last 51. Most recently, immigration looms large. In the first quarter of this year alone, new arrivals accounted for 85 percent of the population increase, most of them settling in Canada's biggest cities. Well, you may not recognize her name, but you'll remember her story. Ellen Campbell was diagnosed with a fatal lung disease in 2011, and that's when she turned to social media to create awareness about organ donation. Her goal was to get Justin Bieber to retweet her, and it worked. Not only did she get that retweet and meet Ellen DeGeneres, but Campbell underwent a double lung transplant in 2012. She has since continued her advocacy work, and today... She received the key to the city of Ottawa, and that is our moment of the day. I never thought that a girl like me could accomplish something like this. So it's such an honor for me. This is the highest award you can receive in Ottawa, and this city is incredible. I love to give back in any way I can for a community that gave so much to me. I think for me, what, what I have accomplished is that uh, you, taking something broken and making it beautiful, uh, you know, which is kind of paralleled my story, you know, being faced with something that's not so great and trying to make the best out of it and using my story to encourage organ donation. Thank you for the delightful gift. All lives are full of negative parts. And if your life consists of only happiness, I'd like you to leave right now now there's the door it's locked i have a key <laughs> <laughs> touche uh so you know spiritually her, her story is is wonderful and and medically as well we, we just learned that she just underwent a second double lung transplant okay. last year which which isn't unusual because lung transplants only tend to last a few years but another life-saving operation for her there and she apparently has a couple of Justin friends because she got messages from Justin Bieber and also from another guy named Justin, the Prime Minister. <laughs> so lots to celebrate in this story, but of course, uh, tragedy is always connected to transplants like double lung transplants. And so she did mention the humble tragedy and yeah. the surge in people who signed donor cards across the country after that. And she talked about how grateful she was. But a uh, fantastic story. And for those of you in Ottawa, in the suburb of Barhaven, there has been for, I guess, about a year now, a street named after her. Yeah. And it's a national for Thursday, June 14th. Good night. Good night. Good night.